tonight on The Breakdown. Super Rugby Aotearoa just keeps on delivering. The panel celebrate just how good the rugby was over the weekend. Mark Robinson, NZR CEO, calls in to chat over the upcoming Aratipu decisions. The Aussies are too happy and we choose our Form 15 from the competition so far. Who's going to make the cut? Kia ora, hello and welcome to the breakdown once again. What a seven days. It has been some fantastic action on the field. It's been all on off the field as well. Of course, this debate about the future of Super Rugby, but so much great action we want to talk about. And no Mills Miliaina this week. The Chiefs lost. So he decided it wasn't <laughs> a, a good show to be at. So I replaced him with another Chiefs player, and Stephen Bates, because I had to have someone on the show. Obviously, Carl Tanana, Sir John Kerwin. And I, I'm not sure who's hurting more, though. Bates or you, JK? Why? Well, were you not in Wellington? We're still second. We're still second. We're still, <laughs> still second. You were, saying, you were saying also before the show got one more point than the Crusaders did last weekend. Didn't exactly. You? Yeah. They had exactly. the bye. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Boy. I'm here for you, JK. I'll tell you what, it was a great weekend though, Kate. You look at all of the great action across it. I mean, for you, you're looking at this, this premier competition. And we've got to remember how lucky we are to have what we've got right now. Yeah, 100%. You know, I think for both games to go down to the last few minutes in the way that they did, I mean... It's outstanding football at the moment, a high level, and every single game is something on it. I've been loving it. We're going to start this breakdown with our moments mm. of the weekend because there is so much fantastic action. And I want to kick it off because it was a stoush between two of the little men. <laughs> two of the little men of the game, the halfbacks, Aaron Smith and Brad Weber. And it started early on, and there were handbags. There was plenty on this game. This was, you're almost talking wooden spoonish. And these guys went head to head, and they went at it. For the full 80 minutes, they kept hammer and tongs. And watch this. Great try, great defence from Weber. Body on the line, Aaron Smith scores. And then, of course, these guys are all black teammates. What do we do? We talk about it afterwards. And Brad Lever was going low. He wanted to go quick shots. And Aaron Smith is talking, yep, I would have lifted you above my head and thrown you <laughs> on the ground. Uh, great to see that for me, though, when I look at uh, guys like that who can share moments like that after a game. They're proud of a great contest. Um, Great character of the game. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. For you, JK? Yeah, well, mine is... Uh, you need to take a look at this because it doesn't get any better. So have a look. There we go. Roll it. That's not my highlight. That is the not my highlight. Me. Yeah, we like that. Wait, no. Good. Wait. Wait. You want pretty good. Yeah, that's my highlight. How good is it? Go to JK's box. I've never felt like that. Oh, <laughs> oh. KT, that was that was harsh, mate. That was harsh, but true. Oh, my mate. What a feeling, though. I mean, unbelievable, right down to the wire. If you're a coach, like KT said, I've been in the other box. Yeah, I've been in the other box, JK. But I tell you what, they would have, you know, there's no better feeling. Every time that happens, and you, every, every so often you get moments that are coaches when, when you, you realise it's all worth it, you know, all the, the hard work you put in, particularly when you've given your team a spray at half-time, which is apparently what they had to do. KT, for you? Yeah, we talk about moments and what you experienced in the box. Well, I've experienced the exact thing against me on the field, and uh, one guy who I thought was on the angry pills, David Banner, we called him, because you don't want to get him angry. Nani Lomapi, I thought, was outstanding in this weekend. And what I love about him, he's playing with a chip on his shoulder, I'd come up with this and get smoked on the outside. Not many people in the world can do Brady Barrett on the outside like Nani, Nani Lau Marpi did. And I like, because he played with a chip on his shoulder. Yeah. That, How good was that? He that talked about line. being frustrated and angry, the fact that... And I love when players find some motivation out of somewhere yes. to prove a point. And he well, talked about continuing that on. And it wasn't us. And it wasn't no, us. No, it wasn't anything. us. <laughs> no, well, I tell you what, it wasn't us. I tell you what, if it was, we should do it every week. Because yeah. if that's the performance... Yeah. How good was it? And it reminded me a little bit, KT, of um, when Ma used to be like that. Mm. And people didn't know whether he was going to rip their heads off or sidestep him. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, look, we've, we used to do that when Jonah was in the side and just wind him up every opportunity we got. And we didn't want him to kick the ball or pass the ball or either. <laughs> we just wanted him to run. We wanted him to go. Corey Jane talked to us about Nani Lamapi. Yes. Just get it and do what you do really well. He's got the other skills. We have seen it. Two wonderful games of Super Rugby over the weekend, Batesy. And your moment comes from another game down south. Mate, I was at this game down south. Remember this name, Jack Jones. I was down uh, Crosshurst Boys versus Cross Cottage. Look at this guy, Jack Jones. Came in about 20 minutes to go to the game. Number 17 on his back. He's a front row. That's the halfway line, I'm pretty sure. That's how quickly <laughs> he gets across the ground and scores pretty much the match when he's right. That's a fabulous try. But his effort 
to me is awesome and sensational. But the thing I like the best, and this happened three times in the game. Look at the crowd. Watch it. Get in there, son. This is straight after the try scored three times. It was such an awesome game and an awesome experience. That is first 15 rugby at its very He won't have to do his homework this week. <laughs> ah, he's he did doing no nothing. homework after that. He's oh, a yeah. champion, right? <laughs> he's a superstar. Extra pudding in the boarding house. <laughs> Superstars. We've had our moments. We've had our opportunity. We don't leave Bernie out of this, and I'm sure it's probably Burn not happening out of FMG Stadium on the weekend for you. But what's your highlight? Oh, you wound me. You so <laughs> wound me. We talk about the tries and they're great and they're flashy, but what about the clinical moments? What about Geordie Barrett, 77th minute, cool as a cucumber, straight through the uprights for the win? It was a beautiful moment. That's a class act right there. In fact, cryogenic kid. So cool. On ice. Well, what about the fact he takes it back almost takes, like a 10 metre line? Takes it back the halfway yeah. just to make it. He's long legs, you see. He <laughs> needs arrogant. the run up, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. Just because I can. Yeah. Just because <laughs> I can, theory. I Why like not? It. Why not? <laughs> All right, let's check in with some headlines. He's played super rugby for the Stormers, the Sharks, and has been a standout on the wing for the Hurricanes, hasn't he? But Cobus fun fake, he's on the move yet again. The 28-year-old, he swapped his Bill Tong for a mince and cheese and now a hot pod and a soggy pot of chips, signing to play for England's Leicester Tigers at the end of Super Rugby Aotearoa. Hunting for a job, though, Sonny Bill Williams. Who would have thought? But as COVID continues to bite his Canadian side, the Toronto Wolfpack, they've pulled out of the Super League season due to financial pressures. It's the former All Blacks' first season with the team which lost its first six matches in the Super League pre-COVID, but I do get the feeling SBW won't be sitting around for too long. There will be a few players at a loose end, though, uh, as the triage unit starts to swell from our punishing Super Rugby competition. Crusaders David Havili and Ethan Blackadder, they're going to miss the remainder of the competition due to injury. Red and Blacks, they are blessed, though, aren't they, with Rolls-Royce bench. So um, pretty confident the South Island unit will cope quite nicely. News isn't so good for Oteri Black. He took a knock to the head during his match against the Canes. He passed an HIA, but we now wait to know his fate moving forward. Lucky that the Blues have a pretty handy first five, isn't it? Which, again, raises the debate, does Bodie belong at 10? You can glove up and slug this out a little bit later, guys, yet again. Uh, a bit of chatter around Ian Foster's decision to name Sam Kane as AB captain before any form had been looked at. Is he the form number seven at present, given the likes of Dalton Papali'i and Duplessis Karifi? They're in blistering form. It's a tough one. Does form... Beat leadership. What do you reckon? Yeah, uh, look, this is going to become to a debate because in the end, you're, you're looking at players across Super Rugby base here. When you look at where Sam Kane is at right now, how do you look at that decision to announce him as All Black captain early? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you look, I'll just first answer Bernie's question: Is he the form number seven? No, he's not. Is he the form number seven at the Chiefs? No, he's not. Both is uh, form number seven at the Chiefs, and in my opinion, the guy that's probably the form number seven of the competition is Dalton Papali'i. And you look at what Dalton is bringing; he's bringing physicality, which Sam Kane normally brings. So the tackles that Dalton makes, they are real tackles, and they hurt people. And that's what Sam normally brings. Will Sam get back there? I'm pretty sure he, he will, but he's not there at the moment. That's what I reckon too, because he's been out for a long time. We've got to remember yeah. that. And we're talking about leadership at the top level, all black level. That's what Sam Kane brings, a wealth of leadership. And he's got the respect of that These squad. are uncertain times, aren't they? Yes. There are uncertain yeah, times where I think everyone was looking for leadership. And Ian Foster had looked at Sam Kane and has faith in him, JK, to lead this group going forward. We've got to remember this is Test Match Rugby. Now, we get talked to all the time of the fact Super Rugby form is not like Test Matches. But we know this competition is not far off it. Yeah, easy decision. He'll be all black captain. Uh, we'll judge him on that form. I think the bi the bigger question is, are we going to pick on form for this current all black side or are we going to give some of the established guys... And it's always been harder to get out of the all blacks than it has been getting. I'm sure Sam will be fine. It's about decision making at the next level. The the, the thing that interesting me is, is rugby at Tiro the, the, the closest thing to test rugby at the moment? You ask the players and they yeah, look yeah, at it and yeah. they're saying it's as close as they can get. So, you know, I've got I've got faith in, in Sam Kane that he's going to get back to his best as well, Bernie. I agree, Jeff. And I think the key thing too is that form is temporary, isn't it? But leadership remains and he's such a, a great, inspiring leader. Yes, so. as was. Our form was temporary. <laughs> <laughs> form is very temporary. <laughs> All right, well, last week, Sir Steve Hansen said that New Zealand rugby owes Australia nothing, absolutely nothing. This week, World Cup winner Rod Kafer said that Aussie rugby needs to 
go it alone. The former Wallaby said that contemplating a New Zealand Aussie comp was a fundamentally flawed concept and that players are, and I quote, mentally scarred by consistent losses to Kiwi teams. It's almost a good thing for us, really, isn't it? The world rankings would back that up. Aussie, they're number seven in the world and they've lost the last 17 Bledisloe Cup series. Here are the issues. Firstly, we're at odds over numbers. It's our party and we'll invite who we want to it. And not everyone's happy that there's a cap of between only two and four likely to be asked to indulge in party games and take home a balloon and a goodie bag. In fact, Rugby Australia chairman Hamish McLennan wants to be a partner at the negotiating table, not left to fend for scraps. And he believes that broadcasters and sponsors, they'd prefer a bigger comp, 10 to 12 teams. What if New Zealand has no one to play with in the sandpit next year? Well, it would get pretty boring playing themselves next year, he says. Fair point. And what of the Pacific team? Well, McLennan loves the idea, but thinks it should be based in Sydney. Basing them in Auckland would be detrimental to the Blues. It would be madness for the Blues. Again, he may have a good point. Back to the Aussies, though. Are they genuinely, genuinely strong enough to front five teams? Peter Fitzsimons says no. He thinks five teams dilutes top players and that their impact gets lost. He adds that often Aussie teams were reduced to doing a victory lap when they won a coin toss against New Zealand. Ouch. He's clear that never has Australian rugby needed New Zealand rugby as much as we do right now. So what does the NZR make of it all? Jeff spoke with Mark Robinson just a short time ago. Mark, thanks very much for coming on the show tonight. A lot of noise coming out of Australia at the moment. What's our relationship as it stands right now with Australian rugby? Oh, look, we're entering a really exciting time, Jeff, that we're, um, we're looking forward to, um, you know, working through more discussions in the next little while about the prospect of, of the competition we're talking about. So, you know, as, as is the case in any of these sort of discussions, we, we just need to um, work through understanding what, what all the different parties will need and um, stay true to the process in this and, and look forward to more and more constructive dialogue. Is Australian rugby important to you? Do we need them in terms of their support financially as well as the fact their competition? Oh, absolutely. We've been very clear that we see opportunities um, to work with um, Rugby Australia as being critical to both um, organisation success and more broadly, you know, the opportunities to, to work into the Pacific and, and the broader um, South Pacific area. So, so nothing's changed around that and we're very clear um, that we'd like a positive, constructive working relationship. So out of the Ata Tipa review, you've talked about the structure or what you're looking towards in terms of a super rugby competition per se, maybe eight to ten teams. If I look at that, how does the ownership of that competition work? Well, there's a number of things, I guess, that are, are sitting behind the um, the review to date, Jeff, that need you know further work. And I guess... Uh, the ownership and the overall regulation of the uh, competition is one of those. So we've looked at a number of different examples from, from around the world, including, including places like Australia and into the States and the UK, as to what um, the ownership structures might be and how the competition will be organised. And we're just going to take a little bit more time as part of this consultation process with all of the different um, potential participants in the competition to work through and, and understand what their requirements might be. So we've got some broad ideas, but to be fair to um, you know, teams that we want to work with, we'd like to give them some input and, and insight into those ideas before we move too much further. You've called for expressions of interest though in terms of this competition. Is that a global opening for anybody to maybe get involved? Are you trying to keep it within the Pacific? Well, we expect the teams to be based out of the um, Pacific Basin area, Jeff, but that's not to say they won't, there won't be potential um, investors or people with interest wanting to come into the process that, that reside from, um, you know, in the Northern Hemisphere. There could be expat Kiwis or Australians um, or people connected to Pacifica living in, in different parts of the world that may very well want to be involved. So we're keeping a very, very open mind at the moment and excited about some of the conversations we've had in the last few days since we announced on Friday and and looking forward to learning more about these um, expressions of interest as we work through it. One of those possibilities you've talked about is a Pacific Island team coming into Super Rugby. Australian Rugby have indicated their desire for that as well. What would be, for you, the purpose of this side? 
Well, a lot of fan research has gone into um, the other tip of review, Jeff, and and one of the things that is highlighted is there is a keen appetite from a whole range of potential interested parties, be be it fans, be it sponsors or or broadcasters, around the introduction of a Pacific team. And, and quite frankly, we just think it's the right thing to do as well. It's good for rugby, it's good for our region, good for our communities, and great for our fans. So, you know, they're, they're the sorts of things that are driving um, our decision making around. Uh, around the competition at present, and and we're excited about you know the colour, the vibrancy that it'll that it'll bring to a competition. We only get so many opportunities to do this sort of thinking in rugby. And in fact, we haven't had one for some time. So we want to really make sure that we remain as open uh, as possible. We consider you know all, all um, expressions of interest on its merits and and work through it with the people that you know want to engage with us. So when you're opening these opportunities to franchises, does that mean, like a Pacific Island team, that all of a sudden some of the control contractually, New Zealand rugby have had over players, centralised contracting, would that have to be relaxed to give an opportunity for more movement? The things, things like eligibility, high performance pathways, uh, how, how these teams work in with uh, provincial unions, ownership, governance, funding will, will be worked through over the next little while. And they're all very fair questions. We just need a little bit more time to to work through um, some of them. And, you know, we have to balance what's right and best interests of, of New Zealand rugby and, and balance that with, you know, the entities coming into the competition, obviously, in the, in the case of Pacifica. If you talk about stakeholders, there's so many involved here. But let's first deal with this relationship with Australia. He mentioned the word critical there, JK, the fact looking across the Tasman. <laughs> well, Sorry, you... mate, I'm just laughing because I thought after that interview, he's got another 457 meetings to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because they haven't decided yeah. on anything. Well, that, I mean, that's the challenge, right, KT, was when you start talking about all these invested parties, when you're trying to put something together like this, but all of a sudden, this back and forth we're seeing that's being played out in the media, I still get the sense behind closed doors, there's a feeling they do need each other. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, and I think the thing that stood out for me financially, you said that was one of the things you spoke about with the Australian team. And looking forward, we've, we've got to look past next year or the year before. We've got to look 10 years down the track, because the Aussies, they're going to get a World Cup at some stage, and we're going to be able to have to bounce off that as well. Those are the things also they've got to take into consideration. Yeah, but I, d I don't know. Look, for me, it's pretty easy. We, I believe you either want the Australians in or you don't. I want them in. But I think right at the moment, we don't want five teams in. Yeah. So that's, that's the problem. I think we have to create an opportunity. And I don't know why there's all this talk coming out saying that we're arrogant and, and, and we don't care, because we do. But at the moment, what we're saying is that five squads from Australia is too many. Yeah. Right? Well, you just want a good product, don't you? And, and it is right. If, if you've got five Australian teams, your product is not going to be good because they're far too diluted, aren't they? But the other thing too, if you've got five, say, say you've got three, which I personally think is a good number, three, the wage bill is also less. You know what I mean? And we know that money is an issue. Well, I'm saying that though, we had Andrew Forrester last week and he's a massive part of the Western Force, yes. but they're the side that, are, that were on the outer, KT. They were the one that, that fought their way back in on the back of support and well, resource support. Yeah. But just merge them for you. Queensland... And well, that, merge, merge them for a year. The rebels and the team, Brumbies he's got that, the money. You come got, together, put them together for, yeah. for a year. But in saying that, if they want five teams, and there's five teams in New Zealand, where does that leave the Pacific yeah, Island side what, that everyone's right. talking about? One thing I want to put here right now: the Pacific Island team is for what? If the Pacific Island team is for the Pacific Island and the players to give them opportunity, it needs to be in the Pacific Islands. Yeah. To take money there, to take revenue there, to take jobs there get the players over there. You know, it doesn't need to be in Australia and it doesn't need to be in New Zealand. I firmly believe that. Well, we just showed a clip then of the, the most recent PI team where Wax and Sitovini in there. Yeah. They're All Blacks. Yeah. That's, I'm sure that's not what they're looking for for the growth yeah, of Pacific game because all they did is those two boys, they played for the PI team and then they come and play for us. I'm sure that's not the idea of it. Australia talked about the desire for them to have it, say, in Sydney. We've got to remember that Sydney's the same population as New Zealand. I mean, you're talking about the depth of play. Now, we know rugby's not the number one sport. No one's there. going. No one's going. It was, no one's yeah. going. I mean, there's 1,500 people, Waratahs versus Blues, pre COVID. Yeah, so if we look and at those dogs. contests, the fact okay. that we go and look at the form of their sides, how much, when we talk about this relationship, how much would we be prepared to give when you look at it? And are they good enough, these yeah. Australian teams? 
Yeah, well, that's the thing, man. And Robbo, what, what, what got for me, he spoke about the vibrancy and the right thing to do, and I'm with you, JK. It has to be in the Pacific Islands to be able to gain that traction and, and like I said, be built and played by the um, Pacific Island players, not the ones staying here in New Zealand or Australia. That's where you get that. The reality is, though, JK, that the very best Pacific Island players that are playing in Europe, they are going to be on such good contracts. That They're not they are supporting back. villages and families and the like, you know, and you can understand that. We've had players from New Zealand who have left for that very, very reason. The fact they're not going to come back and play in this competition for a quarter of the money. Well, the way I see it is that uh, Pacific Island descent people born in New Zealand are on a pathway. Mm. If they're good at rugby, they're on a pathway here. There's the, our system. But it's, I believe it's the Pacific Island players that are back in the islands. I always thought that a Pacific Island team was for them. Am mm. I wrong, KT? No, um, I agree. And if you want to help the Pacific Islands, you've got to put the income back into there. You know, fix up one of the stadiums, play right around the islands. You know, for me, it's not about being in South Auckland, not about being in Sydney. I actually think, though, G, I reckon some of those blokes will come back, the older guys that maybe come in near the end, like their last third of their career. I think they'll come back to the islands. I want to make a point of this Super Rugby team coming and join that and help those young guys try and merge that gap. Maybe they might not be as competitive... Any concerns for UKT trying to bring together the three different cultures because they're very competitive against each other when they play? Yeah. Is that, is that a concern? Is the fact Because I mean, it's not easy when you're putting together a team and the fact that the different backgrounds, everyone's motivated differently. Would you see that being any issue? I don't think so. I think yep. like, when we are running around, there was very distinct lines amongst Fiji, Samoa, Tonga, whatever. I think now a lot of the guys play with each other, been around a lot. I don't think there's that much of a... Um drama anymore in terms of that. How much responsibility would be then on New Zealand rugby and Australian rugby to, if, to support this venture yeah. and to make sure it happened properly? And what do you think world rugby would think about this given the fact that they've distributed into the islands and they haven't seen to this state, you'd think, great results? Yeah, it would certainly be a nursing from New Zealand and Australia. And, that, and, that's, and I think when you look at Look at it over the years. We've done quite well out of the islands and so have Australia. So it is a time to sort of grow the game if we want this game to genuinely be a global game. You know, and if we really want it to be a genuine global game, well, that's where it's got to go. And as you guys said, it's got to go to the islands. Fiji. And I tell you what, it has to happen sooner rather than later. If you start talking about being involved next year, if it's to happen, really oh, challenging. Just one thing. He said it's the right thing to do. So if it's the right thing to do, Everyone helps pay and everyone help looks after Pacific Island, including World Rugby and the French. Mm. There it is. Statement made from Sir John Kerwin. Well, we want you to be involved, of course, in Super Rugby Aotearoa this year. We've got tickets to give away to all of the games this weekend. A couple of fantastic matchups: The Crusaders taking on the Hurricanes and the Blues taking on the Chiefs. Go to the breakdown at sky.co.nz. We've got so much more to talk about after the break. Stay with us. Scott and Basham just had to wait briefly and now the ball across for Lau Marpi. Got on the outside of Barrett. Heading towards the corner. What a try! Puts Garifi into the gap. Here's Lau Marpi again. Bowden Barrett again. Through him he goes. Mackay. Goes left draw, then straightens up off Lowe's on the tackle. Aaron Smith. Aaron Smith's got a player on Mark on the outside. Oh, they're inside the five, the offload. Aaron Smith, did he get there? No, yes. Oh. Aaron Smith, shot for oh, yes. Duncanson. Can you believe it? They're going to win. The Highlanders with the conversion to come. That's right, those were your two game changers this week. Head to facebook.com forward slash two degrees to vote. We'll name the winner in the build-up to the Crusaders and Canes match on Saturday. You can win 12 months of two degrees mobile and broadband, a Samsung phone, plus a field replica super rugby jersey from your favourite team. Well, of course, we spoke before the break with Mark Robinson about our relationship with Australia and the Pacific Island team. I also asked him about where the global calendar is right now in the future of the rugby championship.
So when we start talking about how the structure of a season might look, and of course there's talk about the global calendar, but what role then, if you start talking about these competitions going forward, does the welfare of the players start becoming a big conversation? Well, along with um, you know fan interest and fan engagement, the player welfare piece is right up there as, as some of the most critical uh, factors we consider. So it's it's very very important. And I guess the discussions with World Rugby are ongoing. I'm on another call tonight um, out of Dublin to to get an update of where that's getting to. And we're trying to piece together ultimately what this season structure w would look like. But our players' association are very much central to the conversations we're having with regards to welfare as our as are our competition work experts and our, and our medics in that space. So very keen to make sure that we get the balance right for what the fans love and want to see and um, and obviously looking after key people involved in this competition in terms of the players. So is that update you're hoping to get a, a further an interest or I suppose an indication of where this global calendar uh, sits right now with World Rugby? Are you expecting to hit some progress? Yeah, we are. It's, it's early days. I won't know m more until later tonight. But um, yeah, it's, it seems that there's more comp compromise coming from you know, both sides of the equator in the northern and southern hemisphere. Uh, so we're optimistic that we can get a, a window that will allow you know, players uh, from the Sanzar unions to, to compete uh, in the rugby championship should we be able to get that um, over the line in, in New Zealand. And it sounds like some of the club requirements in the northern hemisphere can be met as well as as well as what the requirements of the Six Nations teams. And does that mean, uh, in regards to this year's rugby championship, what are the conversations? Where are you at? I know it was it's early days in that as well. Of course, talking with our government, but you know, how quickly do things need to move for you to be able to plan for that competition here in New Zealand? Well, the first thing I'd say to that, Jeff, is it's absolutely critical that the fantastic work this country's done in, in terms of looking after the welfare and safety of people is preserved. So. So that, that's very much the forefront of our thinking, and it is for our um, government, as we all understand. Um, to bring you up to speed, uh, we have a, a Sanzar call tonight as well, um, prior to the World Rugby call, and um, we've got the CEOs coming together to look at the, the latest information that we've been able to pull together around how um, some of the commercial um, detail might look, um, pull together some of the ideas that might sit around um, venues and competition formats and be able to share a little bit more thinking there. So we'll, we'll get some feedback on that and then we move through to uh, meetings with the government on Wednesday and then at the end of the week as well on Friday. So we'd like to think that going into next week we have more clarity as to what New Zealand rugby needs to do on behalf of Sanzar in terms of delivering the competition. So everything's on the radar at the moment, so does that include the possibility of tours? The fact, once again, more opportunity, maybe midweek games. We keep going on that about here, particularly here on the breakdown, because we want to see that level of competition. Are those conversations you'll continue to have? Yeah, I mean, I think around um, that, that, those conversations will obviously involve world rugby and, um, and the Northern Hemisphere around the Six Nations. And what I think there is a commitment to doing in the first instance is trying to make sure we've got a window and a calendar that opens up and creates maximal value for, um, for all, for all uh, countries. And then it's once we have that calendar in place, which is still a lot more work to, to do around, then we can look to how we populate that calendar. And we've been very open. You know, last time I was on the show, Jeff, we talked about possibility of, of tours and, and what we might do in any given year across a four-year World Cup cycle to, to populate those um, calendar options, be it something that was put up previously around the Nations Championship, be it tours or be it some other formats that that um, could have merit. So, so again, you know, sort of repeating myself, but around having an open mind to the possibilities here is something we're very, very mindful of because we won't necessarily get another chance and we just want to make sure that we make the most of these opportunities. So before COVID-19 hits, before the Aratipuri review, there was a McKinsey report that came out at the start of the year. And you talk about, I suppose, the future of New Zealand rugby. There are a lot of things and suggestions about a, maybe a possible restructure. Where are you with that report and are any of those things being put into place? Well, it's be, it's be fair to say, obviously, we've had a bit on our plate, Jeff, in the last um, four or five months. Um, but yeah, there, there was a lot of work done uh, in February and March, um, pre-COVID, around um, reviewing the entire rugby ecosystem in this country and looking at how the game um, 
you know, fitted together essentially. Um, it, it highlighted a number of opportunities around the, the fact that uh, the game faced some challenges. It, it highlighted, you know, the opportunity to look at our, our revenue and cost base and and promoted some ideas to, to look at that. It, it highlighted opportunities to get real clarity of purpose across our entire rugby stakeholder group. So they are the sort of things that we'll probably take a closer um, look at in the, in the coming weeks and months. We've got all of our uh, stakeholder groups coming in to, to New Zealand rugby next week, our provincial unions and, and super clubs. And we're excited about the opportunity to sit down with them and and firstly understand, you know, the challenges that they're working through at the moment and then work towards a process that I guess helps co-design the future and, and work towards something that we see is can create a sustainable future for the game in the coming years and, and understand, you know, the needs and wants of those different stakeholders as we work towards that. So, you know, very, very um, open-minded again as to what um, that, that work looks like. Um, certainly taking on board a lot of the feedback we're starting to get um, from those different stakeholders at the moment, but ultimately really excited about the opportunities that can come from having a chance to sit back and maybe reimagine what the game looks like. And, and our team started to do some thinking about that, but don't want to obviously move too far in advance of, of that until we share some of that thinking with, with stakeholders. Uh, like I said, we're really excited to begin doing next week. Critical times for the game. I know you guys are working incredibly hard at headquarters. Looking forward to more feedback about exactly where things are heading, though you must be satisfied, though, with where Super Rugby Aotearoa has gone, and particularly over the weekend. Great crowds, great atmosphere, great competition. That is a hard standard for you guys, I suppose, to maintain going forward. Yeah, but uh, you're right, Jeff. I mean, the, the, the feedback on the, on the competition has been outstanding. The viewership, the engagement... Um, around the competition, I think attendances have been up over 75% on pre-COVID, as have viewership. So, and, and you know, um, social media, um, you know, interaction over 100%. So, absolutely, it's set a high bar. But it's also given us some pretty key basic principles in terms of what fans want, hasn't it? So, so we're going to be very mindful of that as we work through this um, process that we've um, we talked about at the top of the call, and and keep that very much foremost of our thinking when we talk about what's important to fans in, in the coming weeks and months as we as we try and develop something new. Hey, thanks very much, Mark. Great to talk to you, like I said. Can you stay high to Bill Bowman for us from the breakdown? That'll be great. Just you not got to hold Goldie. You keep working on it. Get, get, get JK well, on his case again. I'm sure he'll, he'll listen. We'll keep working at it, mate. Thanks very much. Good man. Thanks. Thanks, Goldie. <laughs> Well, J.K. hasn't spoken for seven and a half minutes. That's the first thing he's struggling with. No, I'm excited. <laughs> That's I'm what excited. you're struggling with. Is the fact I'm that you excited about the future, and I'm going to have another report. And Look, I'm going to... I think this is where, like you say, things are, are slow moving when you've got so many pieces of the puzzle. And maybe that's why New Zealand rugby threw out there the fact the eight to ten team competition to try and get the ball moving. I know it's difficult, but JK, here's your moment in the sun. And <laughs> you've been wanting to do this for about three Copy months. Right so here's your rugby calendar, mate. Take us away. Explain to us how it looks for the people at home. Yeah, so this is how I think we need to move forward. Um, Lucky I'm not CEO because I'll just make this decision and go with it. Um, <laughs> I think we need rug Super Rugby Aotearoa as it is currently played and add two Australian sides and possibly a Pacific Island team. Um, we play that and then June, July we play what I'm calling a Southern Cup which is bringing all the, the current Super Rugby sides back together. The interesting thing about the Southern Cup, I'll talk about that in a sec, KT. And then August, September Rugby Championship with Japan, uh, the Argentinians back in, and USA, and I'm doing the Pacific USA Islands as well. For money, Pacific Islands, obviously. No, well, I think there's a, a promotion relegation from rugby championships, so the loser has to play the winner of the Pacific second Cup. tier, which is Pacific Nations Cup. Um, and then October, November, we we go Northern Tour. Now, I just want to just like to add that this player welfare stuff. Bill Beaumont and his World Rugby guys, who won't make a decision, need to say 30 games per player. No more. No, where do you play? Right? So 30 games a year. 12 months, 30 games. Every player in the world. No one can play 31, get banned. And you see, you look at the structure of that, guys, in terms of the calendar and the way it fits. Those northern tours, are you talking northern and southern tours, JK? Correct. Both, both ways. So in Correct. October, November, so one north, one south. Opportunity for tours. Do you see... But we've asked you to pick the brains out of it, guys, because you are the brains. You guys have come on. <laughs> we've just we come here every week and we <laughs> make it up as we go along. And, yeah, and KT. So we look at the calendar. I mean, the expectations are there's a decent break um, between December and March yeah. before the guys are playing again. 
Yeah, well, I, I think there's a legitimate argument for these, you know, and, and like you say, the different separate competitions that could be funded separately by different sponsors and what have you. And um, yeah, I mean, obviously, Robbo talked about uh, player welfare, which I think, uh, you know, you chuck that on top. You know, we, we have to start somewhere, and I think this is a good starting point. The Southern Cup is where, and explain that in depth. Yeah, so the Southern Cup is, is a little bit like the Heineken Cup. In the Northern Hemisphere, the interesting thing about the Heineken Cup in the Northern Hemisphere is the money is also divided by the teams. So what I'm saying is that we have a Southern Cup, it's cut out of the NZRFU broadcasting, the broadcasting gets divided by the teams in the Southern Cup, you play your two pools and a semi-final and a final. That's where we bring, start bringing the other teams back in. So the Australians are worried about only having two teams in the in the um, in a, a perceived rugby, rugby Aotearoa. So they can bring them in here. They can bring the force back in. They can bring whoever. You're they going want. global here, though. You're talking Argentina. You're talking South Africa. You're talking across a, a realm of of relationships we've previously had. Yeah, that's if we can't kick South Africa out. Well, I've got the alternative then. I've got the Whoa. alternative for you. But you go to my proposal, the fact that I'm staying within our time zones. I'm staying with the fact that, you know, I would like to see us play in Japan, Australia and New Zealand, but that is after two separate competitions. So you are definitely getting rid of South Africa. What's that? South Africa for me. We play them in the rugby championship. We continue that relationship going forward. Same with Argentina, but I'm looking at the fact that I actually want to separate Super Rugby Aotearoa and another team here in New Zealand. And Who are the Vikings? Rugby Australia. I, they've already got a relationship with the Fiji team in the National Rugby Championship and what we do is we come together with 16 teams, four. Who are the Vikings? Who, the Vikings are our sixth team in New Zealand. I thought Cully would like that. I think he'd make a comeback. <laughs> Where are you based? playing for them. Where are they based? They're based in Tauranga. Ooh. Bay of Plenty. The fact, I actually population like that better of than mine. Population <laughs> like that of people. Than mine, I mean, the Chiefs, Chiefs doing bad enough already. You're going to take half their players with the Vikings. Well, what are you on about? <laughs> the fact, I, just, I just look at that. The reason I did that is the fact that all of a sudden we're keeping on our time zones. The four from Japan, the best four of Japan. But the thing being is we get a mix of competition. Yeah. You draw it out of the, you draw it out of the hat. Who's in your pools? Then all of a sudden you go and play them, and it goes for five weeks. The only weeks. the only thing I'd say about that is I'd like to see. American side in there from this coast because they've got 120 million people, haven't they? Have they? I don't, didn't do that. 360 right. odd million. Okay, yeah. there you go. Yeah, so I, for well, you, Batesy? Yeah, I, I enjoy the fact you've got the Japanese sides in, and I, people, people at home that might not quite understand it, they'll say, oh, but the Sun Wolves didn't work. But it's a total different kettle of fish. What you've got there is you've got Corbett, uh, you've got uh, Suntory, and you've got Panasonic, which are three massive companies mm. that have massive backings. Don't forget, You've also got Toyota if you need be. You know, there's another one. So if they're not financially sustainable, who is? Yeah, Christian right. Batesy, Kobe, Retalix playing for them. Can he be picked for the All Blacks in the Southern Cup? Uh, yeah, he can. Yeah. yeah, he can. Because at the end of the day, he's playing for them. That's fine. He gets to top up his money, gets rid of some of that wage subsidy off the New Zealand Rugby Union bill. But also, he's playing in the same competition. You're playing the same players. So you're judged against the same people. So it's when, and also what it also does, a real area of lack of strength with us at the moment, you look at the Chiefs at the moment, is where's all our locks? We get to develop more locks in this competition. Well, I'm just looking at the fact it also dilutes it slightly, KT, because what we're seeing at the moment is these teams are so strong. When they play against each other, they're saying it's test match footy. I think we've got the depth of talent. We've got the ability to expand just to another team. We've got 200 um, professionally contracted players already. Yeah. The fact you probably only need to get 10 or 20 more. And it would give guys... Remember Brett, Brett Cameron? Remember him? Yeah. He's played for the All Blacks. Have we seen him? Manasa Mataeli? Now, this is no slight on them, but there are players, uh, Tamo Amanu, yeah. playing for uh, the Chiefs. Guys who aren't getting opportunities, they're sitting on the sidelines, who are good enough to play. Where's the money go? Where does the money go? Yeah. Well, How did... well the, three, the three countries, the fact it will be divided between the three. Oh, so you're going to still feed it through the... Oh, but through the franchise. Still feed it, no, straight to the franchise. Oh, absolutely. Also, the Vikings could survive. Absolutely, 100%, because that's where I think private equity outside of the game into franchises would work. What I quite like about it, too, you think about the modern world, everything is here and now. You know what I mean? So nice, short, sharp competitions, mm. constantly changing. I know that's almost the modern world, you know? People want things right here, right now, I, short, sharp competitions, different things coming at you all the time. I'd struggle with a 16 to 18-week competition. Yeah, yeah. A yeah. long competition. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. It's challenging. Yeah.
Uh, this will carry on because we just wanted to get our say out there. Let's be honest. We'll go on about it because we've got a Form 15 after the break. But first, of course, tickets to give away. Crusaders, Hurricanes, Blues, Chiefs, State Highway 1 coming up. The Chiefs looking for their first win in Super Rugby Aotearoa. Don't go away, though. Our Form 15 of Super Rugby Aotearoa coming up. Good to be out here and perform the way that I did. I see a lot of people disrespecting my name. And I'll, there's only one way I want to come out and show everyone the way that I play. Too much people talking, I'm just going to be me. I don't know what they fed him this week, but they fed him something and they, they fueled their bus. Oh, is he fired up tonight? And he's a tank and he's hard to stop. <laughs> well, I don't think there's much doubt about who will be the MVP in this game. That's the last guy you want to see run out with. Here's Leo Murphy again. Bowden Barrett again. Well, he didn't use his speed or his pace to go on the outside. He just went straight through him. And the Hurricanes have won a beauty here in Wellington. Probably one of the best games we've ever seen him play. Well, let's be clear about a Form 15. This isn't an all-black side we're selecting. This is a team we're picking after every weekend. This is guys who come in and out. It's a revolving door. Katie's come into the conversation late. He argued in the green room right through it. JK and I went head-to-head. No head and Batesy, the only guy who's actually coaching and has got a future in coaching, <laughs> will be the difference maker. The spotlight is on the Form 15. <laughs> And we're going to start up front. And this is where we got to. Joe Moody, Dane <laughs> Coles, <laughs> Offer to Anga Fussy, Putty Putty Parkinson and Patrick Tui Palotu. When I was Good on team. the Zoom, Putty Putty Parkinson Good. was not in the team. You left the Zoom early? Yeah. Batesy and I started talking. It's Good team. Wrap it up. Yeah, it's, it's a good team. It's a good side. What is well, that? Good well, let's, let's talk about Putty Putty Parkinson. Look where he's got oh, to, okay. Batesy. <laughs> yeah, okay, you guys. You talk about a form, form team. Like, him and Ash Dixon are a combination, but he's so tall. Just his ability to pluck lineouts out. He must be at about 98 percent line out time but also what I enjoy about him he's a slight frame he's obviously over two meters tall but he's quite slight but he seems to put a little bit of beef on and with that beef he's brought this into his game and that's what I quite enjoy about his, his progression. Yeah he plays heavy doesn't he he's gotten better and better throughout the super rugby competition that's for sure but JK does he supersede Sammy Whitelock I know you had an issue here you, you picked Come Sammy but, didn't you? Put, hey? put it this way we're on the zone we had this selection meeting and when I left Whitelock was on the team. That's all I'm saying. I, I think Whitelock operated at 99%. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, That's one percent. I mean, you know, hey, Sam Whitelock didn't play at the weekend. This guy did. Yeah. But in saying that, you know what we did? We then switched him out and we put Sam Whitelock in. Because <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't argue with the fact, because we could. <laughs> and the fact, we knew you'd spit the dummy and go, oh, where was my Sam Whitelock? Well, you tell me why <laughs> Sam Whitelock continues to be one of our premier locks. Well, I just think he does everything brilliantly. Like, he's not probably carrying as much as Putty Putty at the moment. And Let's I think put Putty, Putty in there then. I think, <laughs> I think Putty Putty is playing exceptionally well, but I just couldn't... With him and Paddy at the moment, I just think it's, a, it's just an amazing... You know, if you're picking this team... Hold on, awesome. we, took, we weren't picking combinations, we were picking on merit. So don't change the... We... No, no, I still think he is the yep. in form. Yeah. Can and he I, get better? Yeah, he can, but I still think he's the best. Oh, I think he's totally be accurate. Yeah. Really accurate. Yeah. And, and, a, and a great leader. And you've got to factor all those things when you talk about form. And, and like you say, it's those little things where he's so accurate, what makes the difference, the difference between an experienced lock and a young guy like Putty Putty Parkinson. That's why the Crusaders are going good. I don't think you can argue with the other ones. I mean, the, yeah. uh, mind you, Dane Coles, uh, Cody Taylor's playing really, really well. Ash Coles is in there, please. Yeah, yeah. You know, look, I, and I think off a tying a fussy yeah. for the Blues, they've needed to stand up, I think, has been, been fantastic. And Joe Moody just keeps doing what he does incredibly well. Let's move to the loose forwards and halfbacks. And we'll start on the inside there. Shannon Frizzell, Dalton Papali'i, Adi Savia, Aaron Smith and Richie Moanga. Now, of course, there's a lot of debate. So you changed this one as well? We didn't change this one. <laughs> so we, we look deeper into the stats. We look deeper Ladies into the and gentlemen, when you're at home, never, never get off a Zoom early. Exactly. <laughs> well, you're obviously your busier than we yeah. were. We wanted to keep going on it. But, OK, let's talk about Adi Savia in the last two weekends. The Hurricanes change of form, starting to play really, really well. Adi Savia, for me, is playing well. Is he, though, a number eight? 
Yeah, I, I think what hurts Artie is his versatility. And I'm not that I'm siding with JK because he's sulking. But he, he, is, he is playing really well. But what to me, what hurts Artie is a little bit his versatility. But when you look at him as a number eight, I believe he's more of a number seven. But at super rugby level, he does a fantastic job at number eight. And what he does do, he combines combines and allows someone like Karifi to get on the field. So his combination there is key, but I believe as you go higher, perhaps a number, uh, number seven. Uh, he's been world class. He was world class last weekend. And, and, I, and I think he's a guy that we need to find uh, where his best impact is, KT, going forward. And we've got into this point of the balance of getting him out on the field. Is it in the number eight jersey for you? We're still searching for that, Kieran still, No, Kieran Reid. Yeah, I, I, I particularly think we need specialists. We spoke about specialists in, in, in certain positions. I think number eight's a specialist position in particular, you know. And like Batey said, it's super rugby. Yeah, sure, he can get away with that. That's what we're picking at the moment. The next level, questions. So the question is, is it Hoskins to Tutu? Because he's injured, missed last weekend. All of the talk was about Hoskins. Uh, I don't think you can argue, Batesy, his impact on the game. And did the Blues miss him significantly? And if you go by form... Has he been that little bit better? If you look at the whole uh, competition, yes, I think he has. You know, he's been he's been more or less the standout the whole competition. The only one that's matched him is the guy next to him, Dalton. You know what I mean? But you look at his speed off the back, he's a genuine number eight. He plays there. His speed off the back, again, what he brings, as you see here, he's got line-out ability. So be it attacking or defensive line-out, he's got the whole package. His defensive work is getting better. And if you look at form... To me, he's a guy who has been number one, number two pick for the Blues all year because of his form. What I'm impressed with Hoskins is right from the get-go, he's been talked up all year and he hasn't succumbed to it. He's really stepped up to that, um, that, that, that chat as well and hasn't gone to his head and he's continued to be able to perform. And Dalton Popoletti, Batesy, finally playing his true position. Yeah, I'm, I'm a massive fan. I, I really believe that he is the form number seven of, uh, of this competition. And... And it's only come about because he's got to his specialist position. Remember when Blake Gibson was around, he was playing six. Did he have the same impact in the game? In my opinion, no, he didn't. But what he's doing, and I know we're not talking about test match rugby, but what he's doing, I believe, is his defensive work is second to none. He's just getting off the line and just smoking people. And when they're hit, they know they're hit. So my question to you then, Batesy, is do you believe... So I personally believe that Fullback specialist, wing you can move around a wee bit. Do you believe that loose forwards need to get back to specialists in each, each role? Because we are moving away from that around the loose forwards. When you look at Adi Sevier, I think he is an amazing seven, and I think Hoskins is, would be an incredible number eight, but as a specialist. And you look at the so, balance of those three, Batesy, when you look at those, are they all specialists in their position? Yeah, they are. The, the one thing you do not have there with those three there is I'm not sure you've got a genuine fetcher. So Dalton melts people with his tackling, but he's not a genuine fetcher like the way Boucher or something like that. And Sam Kane. Uh, yeah, yeah, guys like that. So that's the one thing. He's got genuine, two genuine ball carriers at six and eight, big men who will hurt people. Then got Dalton, you've got to remember Dalton as well. He's a big, big man, and he can hurt people. So that me, the only thing that's missing in there, plenty of line-out ability, the only thing that's missing is a genuine fetcher. And that's Artie. Uh, and that's Artie. Uh, and the controversial outside backs. And JK's probably not going to like this either. It's just <laughs> the way that it works. <laughs> The fact that, look, we put a list together. Geordie Barrett at the back at fullback. On one wing, Will Jordan. We've got on the other wing, Caleb Clark, uh, Rico Ioane, and Nani Lamapi's form is irresistible. We've mm. seen it on the weekend. Rico Ioane doing a great job at centre. JK, I mean, you look at this and other yep. people, but you're a big Caleb Clark fan. And once again, out of sight, out of mind, didn't play on the weekend, but has been great. Yeah, KT went to the sevens, mm. lost a little bit of weight playing incredibly well, strong. I like having a little bit of balance on the wings. I like having someone big and strong um, and then maybe a bit bit more pace on the, on the other wing, but a bit more different as a player. But I think he's been outstanding and you can't leave him out. KT? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you totally. I think what he's learnt in the sevens in terms of professionalism, in terms of nutrition, in terms of fitness levels and mental toughness in particular really has carried on in this uh, Super Rugby competition. So I think, once again, JK, his vision, his strength, his ability, I think is unquestioned. I think he deserves that spot for sure. So you know what we did? We took Changed him out. It. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we took him out. So Batesy and I had a chat oh, and we talked about goodness. the 80 minutes that George Bridge played against the Blues and it was sublime. Game changing in the big moment, big matches. Here's a guy who stood up and we talked about the revolving door 
Here it is, the challenge is now on Caleb Clark because George Brooks no, no, showed no. everything he is great at. But basically, I... No, I don't care. I got I can't, off the no, zoom. About time and you my didn't argument, care. And my argument at the time was, this guy is world-class, I love him, but he hasn't been on form in the last three or four games like well, Caleb Clark has. Game. Exactly. exactly. But we're going on form. Yeah, the perfect 80 minutes. I'd rather take the perfect 80. Let's, let's be honest and honest with the public. What the happened team. is you two are fighting like this, but 10 times worse on the Zoom call. I was shut in my mouth and didn't <laughs> want to make a decision. So they said they lumped it on me. And I said that his 20 minutes against the Blues, not by himself, but almost single-handedly, won the game for them in the biggest game of Aotearoa pre- uh, so far. Stick to the loose we could, uh, Stick to the loose Bernie, was Bernie on the score too? I tried to. Hey, number eight, just put your head down. Just because you had no Wi-Fi and you didn't get on. It's not our fault. <laughs> Let's be honest. Uh, I wonder if the we could have picked, like We this. could have picked another 15. We could have picked another 15. Bernie, quickly come in here. Save us with a notice board. Oh. Save us. Who do you Please. pick? Caleb the Lord of his momentum. You probably picked Sean Wainui. <laughs> George Brooks. Actually playing well. George Brooks yeah, he's playing long. really well. Sorry, JK. Uh, look, he worked alongside our parliament over the last few months, but on Saturday, Dr Ashley Bloomfield, he's going to oppose them. He is playing against the parliamentary rugby team and will stand shoulder to shoulder, well, sort of shoulder to shoulder, with the likes of Norm Hewitt, Rodney Soyalo. They may well need a doctor in the house. It'll be pretty handy. Round seven this weekend, can you believe it? Super Rugby Aotearoa heads to Crusader country. Fresh off a bye, the Crusaders, they'll try and pull a handbrake on the Hurricanes. They are building momentum. 6.30 kickoff for that game, or coverage on Sky. Then the Blues at home against the Chiefs on Sunday. Catch all that action from here at 3pm. If you haven't got tickets, let us sort that for you. Double pass for you and a mate. Email us at thebreakdown.co.nz. Easy as. And last week's winner, Natalie Jones, Chiefs fan. Why are you smiling, Natalie? Must have been half time, I reckon. Yeah, well, it's actually three minutes to go. <laughs> it was three minutes to go. I think they had the line out drive. There was the line out drive. <gasps> Thanks, Bernie. I tell you what, four on the table. Tough work. Tough work. Love it. Tonight. Hold on for the next weekend. Ash Bloomfield is going to Nani Lamapi. All the oh, I, I highly doubt that. He's going to put yeah, someone in isolation. Just on, behalf of the breakdown <laughs> team. on behalf of the breakdown team, just a quick shout out to the Hayden family. Thinking of you. Take care. One or two moments in the game that makes a difference. And you just gotta stay on, be ready, and just give everything all the time. Are we are excited for the challenges to Turn our focus to the Crusaders, massive game. Let them people keep uh, disrespecting my name because I'm gonna turn up every week. My mindset is always run hard. And if you get hit, then make sure you run harder the next time. How much of a challenge will it be for the Crusaders, the fact they have to front up against the team that's in form? People talking, I'm just going to be me. These matches are not won by one moment or two moments. It's about moments compounding and about building pressure. Crusaders wants yeah. to finish the job off. Numbers away to the left. He's got it back. This kid is sensational. I know it's not the result uh, you guys wanted. We'll build and we'll keep going forward.